Hello and welcome to Heartlight Vedic Astrology. Today I was going to go through the analysis for the new moon or Amavasya. That's coming up on December 12, 2023. It seemed like the uh, theme for this uh, new moon is stepping into authentic spirituality. So let's see. Uh, note beforehand, the information presented here is for educational purposes only and should not be considered medical, financial, professional, or life advice of any kind. If you are in need, please contact an appropriate professional for support. Okay, and then you might take a minute or two to read the rest of this disclaimer. If you're new to Vedic Astrology or Jyotish um, or my videos, uh, all of my teaching videos on the subject are in my concepts playlist so that they're easy to find. Uh, and wherever you see a double asterisk in one of my talks, that means that there's a teaching video on that subject. So, you know, if you see a word or phrase or something that you're like, oh, what's that? Um, and you see a double asterisk, there should be a video so you can learn more if you're interested. Um, for these sort of uh, interpretation videos, I use a lot of concepts. Um, and so this list of uh, videos here that I've done is the, are the ones that I think will uh, help you the most, again, if you're new to all this. So, North, South, and East Indian style charts, introdu introduction to navigating a birth chart, Lugna, Ascendant, Rising, First House, those are all different names for the same thing. Introduction to the constellations or Rashis, constellation or Rashi categories, planetary aspects, natural benefic and malefic planets or Grahas, nakshatras or lunar mansions, Parivartana Yoga, that's a planetary combination. Um, and then I have a whole list of uh, symbolism of each planet. And so uh, if you go to the Planets Grahas playlist, you know, if you want to learn more about Jupiter, Mercury, Venus, Saturn, that sort of thing, I have videos on each of those planets. Um, and then um, I'm also building up my playlist on houses or bhavas. And so um, today we're going to see, um, well, uh, we keep go you'll see that we keep going back to the second house, third house, and fourth house. So um, you might look at those videos if you're interested in more information about specific houses. All right, so here's a chart for um, the specific uh, moment in time of the new moon or Amavasya, as it's known as in uh, Sanskrit. <clears throat> and again, in my work, I use North Indian style charts, which this is. Um, and so you always start at the top, that's the rising sign, first house, ascendant, lugna, all different names for the same thing. And then to find different houses, you count counterclockwise, up and back, yeah. Um, so the new moon is happening December 12th at 1832 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, the day lord is Mars and the hora lord or our lord is moon. And so already that gives us some information about this moment in time. So Mars is all about kind of new actions, innovation, courage, uh, that sort of thing. And then the mind is, uh, moon is the mind, uh, especially the emotional mind. The Desha period or the planetary period for this moment in time is Mercury, Jupiter, Saturn, Venus. Okay, so just from those planets, we get some information, right? So Mercury and Jupiter are both education planets, student and teacher. Um, Saturn is kind of like structure, antiquity, can be kind of old-fashioned, that sort of thing. And then Venus, Venus and Jupiter are both there in this list, and Jupiter is a spiritual counselor, and Venus is the worldly counselor. So you can see that like just, just from that, we're, we're getting like mind, education, structure, advice, yeah. The Lugna Nakshatra, and the Lux Nakshatras are the lunar mansions, so that's uh, every day the moon is in a different part of the sky called a Nakshatra, there are 27 of these, and so uh, as the moon goes around the whole zodiac, uh, it'll go through each of these Nakshatras, which is, if you if the moon passes through a Nakshatra in about a day, uh, 27 and a half days gives you a full lunar month, yeah. So the... Um, Lugna nakshatra, so the rising sign nakshatra, is Purvasu. So Purvasu is symbolized by a quiver of arrows. So it's like that, uh, you know, I guess, archers, they ha have that thing usually on their back, almost like a backpack where they have their arrows stored, and they kind of reach back and pull an arrow and then um, pull their bow back, pull the string of their bow back and set the arrow off. Um, so there's something about, you know, and the, and the energy of that is like something that has a home base, but that goes out and comes back, goes out and comes back. And I do think that that's relevant uh, for all, all that we talk about today. 
The moon is in the nakshatra of Jaista. So Jaista is a nakshatra that's symbolized by a talisman. So a talisman, um, it can be, uh, is related to protection of different kinds. So it can be physical protection. Like sometimes when people have important placements in Jaista, um, they will literally be somebody like a police or military, somebody whose job is to protect. Um, but Jaista can also mean uh, like spiritual protection, like the talisman that a shaman would wear. Okay. Um, and then Jaista also has this uh, connotation or kind of symbolism of, of the older senior senior person in a, in a group or family or tribe. Yeah. So I think all these things are going to play out as we'll see here. Um, and just to provide a little bit of context, so I looked up the Chidragrahas. The Chidragrahas are planets that kind of um, indicate points of vulnerability or weakness. And uh, uh, the four Chidragrahas uh, for this moment of time are Venus, Sun, Mercury, Saturn. And if you notice, I put highlighted here in this light green color, Venus, Mercury, and Saturn, because the Desha period is Venus, Mercury, Saturn. So we're actually running a, a planetary period where three of the uh, Chidragrahas are being activated. And Venus, uh, of the, uh, you know, if we look at these three, Venus symbolizes especially spouse, but like relationships in general, social socializing, relationships generally. Um, you know, sometimes we're specifically spouse, not all, but not always. Mercury is all about thoughts and decisions and analysis and logic. Um, and then Saturn is about structure yeah, and antiquity, um, you know, and, and things that can be old fashioned potentially. Um, yeah. So again, it's already giving us some energy to understand this moment in time. So let's go through the chart starting at the top in the Lugda. Um, this is a Gemini rising chart. Uh, you can see the little three there. That little three there indicates the third constellation or of the zodiac, which is Gemini, also known as Mituna in Sanskrit. And it's a dual air sign uh, or Dwisva Bhava Vayu. Uh, if you don't know what dual air sign means, uh, you might look at my video on um, constellation categories. Uh, that'll help you with that. Very brief, briefly, what that means, though, is that uh, dual signs um, have this uh, kind of tendency to be wavering. They can kind of they can be of two minds of something, so they can be see both sides of the equation, uh, which can be great because they can be very uh, balanced uh, that way. Uh, but they can also be very confused that way as well. So it can go either way depending on how things stand in the chart. And it's also an air sign. So Gemini folks primarily kind of live and work in the world of ideas. Because air symbolizes, you know, kind of the uh, kind of uh, fluctuating patterns, like kind of um, uh, wind patterns of the mind. You can kind of think about it that way. All right. So in this Gemini Lugna, uh, we have a uh, Mars, uh, which is in Jaista aspecting the Lugna. Uh, and Mars is in the sixth house here. We also have Mercury, which is in the seventh house and is aspecting here. So we have Mars and Jaista aspecting the Lugna, and we have Mercury and Purva Shada aspecting the Lugna. So Jaista already mentioned, um, you know, there's this protection energy. And especially with Mars, Mars is in, it can symbolize things like enemies. It's in the house, sixth house, uh, which represents enemies. Mars is a fiery energy, and it's there with the sun and the moon. Um, so, uh, and Mars is very much like a physical planet or symbolizes physical things. So this, um, this might indicate that there's some conflict here. And again, if this was a person or this moment in time, there's this feeling of defensiveness against some pushback. Um, yeah. Luckily, though, Mars is in its own sign. So it's actually going to help protect this uh, potential fallout um, here. Um, but I think it is mostly a fallout. The other thing to note is that Mars is combust. So uh, since Mars is so close to the sun, it means that it's combust, and what combustion means is that, uh, in, in Vedic astrology, is that since a planet, a true planet, is so close to the sun, 
you can't see it anymore because it's eclipsed by the light of the sun. The outward um, picturing or the outward external manifestations of the planet are not seen, just like the planet itself is not seen when it's so close to the sun. But internally, um, those um, um, those uh, those uh, representations of the planet can be more uh, intense, actually. So it looks like this defensiveness is actually more of an internal quality, um, more than an actual true, you know, like, you know, full-on fight or conflict or whatever that's going on here. Um, the other thing to note is that Mars is with Sun and Moon. That's also, I think, important for this chart because Sun represents father and authority and Moon represents uh, mother and the mind. And Mars can also represent siblings. So um, when you have siblings, uh, father and mother in the sixth house of enemies, um, you know, and all three of them, Mars, Sun, and Moon, are all in this uh, Jaista nakshatra, you might be feeling defensive with your family, at least your family of origin. Yeah, the people that you grew up with. Yeah. Um, although, again, I think the conflict is more internal rather than external, you know, rather than there actually being a fight, you know. Um, you know, between people, I think the conflict is within this person or in this, you know, again, if we're looking at a moment of time in this moment. Um, but when we have, uh, and then Mercury and Purvashada, Purvashada is uh, symbolized by um, a winnowing basket. So one of these baskets that you kind of shake and then it, it kind of, uh, you cull wheat, for example. And so when you shake the wheat, the hull falls off of the kernel of wheat, the edible part, the unedible, inedible part falls away from the edible part. So Mercury, since it represents things like thoughts and ideas and the rational mind, is in this like processing, you know, con you know processing ideas through the energy. Yeah. The culling the wheat, you know, what's what's edible and what's not edible, that sort of thing. And again, this combust Mars is aspecting into the Lugna, and this Mercury is aspecting into the Lugna. Luckily, when Mercury aspects into the Lugna, because Mercury is going uh, aspecting into its own sign, that brings strength to this person and their personality, physically, mentally, emotionally. Uh, but you do have this inner conflict uh, energy as well. But if, Mer if Mars is the leader, you know, the, the leader of the army, commander-in-chief of the army type energy, and Mercury's a rational mind and thoughts and ideas, this is somebody who's a thought leader. Again, if this was a person that we were looking at. Yeah. Um, and because Mercury is in this Purvashada energy and the Lugna is uh, ruled by Mercury, part of what's happening here, part of the ideas or notions that this person is sorting through is their own concept of self, their own identity. Yeah. Um, and then Mars is a planet of courage. Um, so even though there's this defensiveness, there's also this strength and bravado, you know, kind of fiery energy for movement and change that's being brought to the Lugna. Um, so there is the strength. And again, this Mars is kind of, um, besides being courage, the seniority with the Jesta. So when I see this all together, what I'm seeing is somebody who's really trying to decide who they want to be. And having the courage to actually move in that direction, not just kind of uh, think about it from themselves, but actually the what they end up deciding about themselves is going to end up just also uh, redirecting their actions moving forward. Um, and so there's this branching out, um, also because of this innovative energy that Mars brings to the Lugna. But again, it's in defense mode. So there's this a little bit of a conflicting energy here. Again, I think mostly an internal conflict where the person wants to move forward, but there's this defensiveness potentially with the um, family of origin. Um, and the Lugnatia, Lugnatia means the ruling planet for the chart. That's Mercury because uh, Mercury rules Gemini. It's gone to the seventh house. Uh, the seventh house represents relationships, um, especially relationship with spouse or spouse-like partner, also business relationships, um, and independent business potentially. Um, so, uh, so that's also part of what this person is sorting through. And because it's a dual sign, uh, Gemini and, and Mercury is a dual planet, um, probably this, again, if this was a person, they're probably sorting through all these things, 
like who they want to be, relationships, independent business, like they might be thinking about starting an independent business. Yeah. Um, and what's nice about uh, Mercury being in Sagittarius, Sagittarius is ruled by Jupiter. Jupiter is a great benefic. Um, all planets do well in Jupiterian signs. Um, and Mercury happens at this moment to be in Purushada, which is this, you know, kind of processing contemplative energy. But it just went through Mula Nakshatra at the beginning of Sagittarius. Um, and Mula Nakshatra is symbolized by a bunch of roots tied together. And so, um, and there's a, there is this, you know, quite destructive energy that can uh, be a part of that Mula energy, uh, Mula Nakshatra. But it's destruction with with a new growth because again these are like roots and bulbs like agriculture, you know. I always think of like I mean the symbol is the bulb, right? So there's some some fr fruition there, but to get from the seed to the bulb, there's this destructive process. Like the seed has to die to itself before it can develop into, you know, a bulb like a carrot or a beetroot or something like that that's actually edible and nutritious. Yeah, it's something that's goes from per potential to per, you know productiveness yeah but that's a very uh, energetically costly and you know kind of hidden you know what's actually going to happen like there are growing pains there so all that's involved with mula so mercury just went through mula um and mercury again since it's the lignatia the person probably just went through some kind of hit you know um, or felt like it was some kind of hit and it was like actually like this um uh, personal transformation energy that seems to be going on here. And they're now they're kind of sorting through, like, okay, this just happened. What does this mean for me? What do I want to do moving forward? You know, that sort of thing. Luckily, though, uh, Jupiter's retrograde in the 11th house, uh, being retrograde makes Jupiter strong. Jupiter's in Ashwini nakshatra uh, at this time, and Ashwini is a... a the symbol of an Ashwini is the Kumara twins, um, who are the celestial healers. So that brings even more kind of healing, rescuing type energy with this aspect of Jupiter on the seventh house in Mercury. So Mercury sitting in this nest of Jupiterian kind of rescue energy. So that's actually nice. That's going to take, even though there's this these growing pains that are going on here, the, that Jupiterian energy is um, going to take the edge off of some of that. And also it's going to bring a lot of spiritual uh, spirituality, so spiritualizing of this process um, to this person because Jupiter is like the spiritual counselor. Yeah. Um, and also uh, because Jupiter is shining onto, you know, aspecting onto Mercury, Mercury is in this house of Jupiter being in Sagittarius, Mercury itself is going to be in, imbibed, kind of, excuse me, imbued with all this uh, kind of uh, rescuing uh, spiritual teacher, spiritual advisor energy. So that's going to be deeply integrated into this Mercury, which is the ruling planet for the whole chart. Um, yeah, so that's all going on. And then the other thing to note, notice about this chart right off the bat, um, just for the whole chart, is that there's a Malavya Yoga and a Shasha Yoga. So there are two Raj Yoga here. So Malavya Yoga is the Venus in its own sign in the fifth house. So um, that's really important because Venus is the worldly counselor, and you have this mutual aspect going on between Venus, the worldly counselor, and Jupiter, uh, the spiritual counselor. So this person, uh, has, you know, and both of these planets are active right now because the shop period is Venus, Jupiter, Mercury. So there's a lot here to be said about being a kind of a practical but spiritual counselor advisor. And bringing that into the uh, personality, into the chart as a whole. And then we have Shasha Yoga here, and Shasha Yoga is formed when you have Saturn in its own sign in a Kendra or Trikona, and Saturn's in a Trikona, that's the ninth house. Um, and Shasha Yoga is all about, um, it's another Raj Yoga, royalty yoga, it's a power yoga. Um, and Saturn is in the ninth house of authority, 
of a guru, a father of government. Um, so this is a very strong Saturn right now, uh, being in its own house. Um, as Saturn happens to be in a nakshatra called Shatabisha. Uh, Shatabisha is uh, translated as 100 healers. So Saturn, though, being a malefic planet, um, it might indicate uh, things that are difficult to heal. Uh, what's a possibility here? Um, Saturn, it's, you know, swa in its own sign in the ninth house can indicate a very uh, strong but old kind of set in their ways, especially their thinking, because uh, Saturn is not only in its own sign, but it's specifically in the sign of Aquarius, which is a fixed air sign. So whereas the uh, Mercury... Gemini is a dual air sign, so somebody who can think on both sides, you know, the fence. Saturn is like very fixed in their thoughts and unwavering. So that's a very different energy. And again, the Saturn, Swa, and Aquarius is in the house of father, guru, authority, government. So there can be issues here potentially. Because this is just, this is not somebody, you know, this ninth house business is not something that's going to move. The other thing potentially with this ninth house is that Saturn in its own sign, either Saturn in uh, Capricorn or Saturn in Aquarius, you can get indications that that's um, uh, like a very old uh, society, like Indian specifically. So uh, when people have Saturn in its own sign in their charts, they might be interested in things that are um, kind of old cultures, especially uh, Indian, you know, ancient Indian culture. Like clearly I have this in my chart because I do ancient Indian astrology and ancient Indian medicine and I teach yoga. <laughs> yeah, so I know the Saturn in its own sign pretty well. Um, uh, yeah. And then the thing is this ninth house is also um, uh, satsang. So spiritual community specifically. The ninth house also represents religion. A little bit different from spirituality. Religion is more of the formal structured, um, community-based uh, you know, uh, type of uh, relationship with the divine, where spirituality, I think, is a little bit more freeform. At least that's uh, how it sits in my mind. So there's a lot of power here. You know, we have Mercury aspecting its own sign. We have Malavya Yoga. We have Ashasha Yoga. We have the Venus and Jupiter, you know, uh, mutually aspecting each other. So I think there's a lot of good energy here, but there's some drag. Uh, because especially the Saturn in its own sign is aspecting onto Jupiter. Jupiter is the planet that represents optimism. Saturn is a you know a planet that represents skepticism, taking things slow. So Jupiter represents expansion. So there is Saturn is dragging on uh, the expansive energy that Jupiter wants to present, um, and so. You can literally, and especially uh, Saturn aspecting into the 11th house, the 11th house also represents things like gambling or taking risks generally. Um, so we have Jupiter, the planet of optimism, with Saturn, the planet of skepticism. So again, there's a dual nature going on for this Mercury person, Gemini person, if it is a person. Um, you know, should I take a risk or should I s maintain the status quo? What's going on? And you see the Jupiter aspecting in the fifth house, of uh, which can represent courage, and Saturn aspecting in, the, in this third house of courage. So again, you have this, do I expand or do I stay where I am going on at courage? So again, that's, that's the kind of, I think, the internal waffling that's going on for this Gemini Mercury person, or moment in time, if you're not a Gemini person. Um, okay, so then let's go through the chart. We'll go uh, through house by house. Uh, go. So if we go to the second house, second lord here is the moon, and the moon is combust right now because it's new. So the moon is not very strong. And moon is in uh, Jesta with sun and Mars in the sixth house of enemies. Um, so that could either mean <laughs> like silence or conflicts. Um for the family or inner circle here. Um, but this is a family that's established. Um, uh, because the sun is there. So there's this like... Um, uh, prolonged energy with the sun. Because the sun 
is always shining and always shining its light. So, so there does look like there's some, you know, that kind of, you know, there's confluence there with some, potentially some conflict with the family. But again, it may be an internal conflict. It may be that this uh, Gemini person is just keeping their mouth shut, is just not speaking, sharing, not like speaking, like avoiding, like, um, you know, uh, I'm not speaking to you because we're fighting and I don't want to deal with you type energy. It might just be that they're not speaking up to their family and sharing with their family what's going on with them. So it could be that <clears throat> because there's this protective energy. So maybe this Gemini person is not speaking up to protect themselves because they're not sure which way they want to go. And so rather than get presented to the family and the family's like, okay, you know, what? because they're going to ask questions or whatever, you know, they're going to have some response potentially to whatever this Gemini person shares. It may be that the Gemini person just isn't ready yet to share that because they're not sure where they stand because, again, they're contemplating with this poor of a shot energy and then they've got this Jupiter-Saturn mix business going on. So, um, yeah. Um, the third house, uh, we have this Jupiter-Saturn energy going on. Um, so it's a very strong Saturn. Uh, it's shot to be Shah with Jupiter and Ashwini. So the third house is also a written communication. Um, so uh, especially um, about old religious traditions, authority, community, because Jupiter is, in, is not only in the 11th house that represents gambling and risk-taking, but... Um, social groups. So if ninth house is a commu spiritual community, uh, 11th house is kind of personal public community groups, that sort of thing. So um, so there again, there's this dual nature of like how we expand but keep, save but expand, optimism versus skepticism in terms of um, spirituality and religion, or how do we integrate them potentially? But right now the Mercury person is like sorting through all this. Then the fourth house, we have Ketu and Chitra. Um, and again, uh, the lord of the sixth house is Mercury. So uh, Mercury, this Mercury person, is contemplating uh, the fourth house. And I just did a, a, a video on the fourth house. Um, and one of the things it represents is like the family lineage. So the Mercury person is contemplating the family lineage and the K2 there. K2 is a pretty explosive energy. It's usually a separatist type energy. And it's in Chitra. So Chitra is a lunar mansion, a nakshatra, uh, that's symbolized by a gemstone. So there's a lot of facets on the gemstone. And so you can think of like architecture and structure with Chitra. So it's this uh, potentially separatist or like um, changing the structure of the family line. Or some kind of unusual structure of the family line, like a deviation. Yeah, that's what you can kind of think of here. So they're contemplating this unusual structure separation. So it's, it may be, so that's where I'm picking up. And, and K2 also represents spiritual energy. So that's where I'm picking up that this person, again, if this is a person or moment of time, is that they're contemplating a shift uh, away from their family and their family tradition, family line. Um, and that may be why they're they're quiet because they're not ready to share that because they're not exactly sure how their own thoughts are or what their what their decisions are here. But that's part of what they're uh, pulling through. Um, then we have the fifth house with Venus Swa. That's really great. A lot of great practical advice here. Although Swati is, Venus is in Swati here, so Swati. Swati is symbolized as a nakshatra symbolized by a new grown grass blowing in the wind. So this is like new developments that's fragile. They're fragile. So this uh, advisorship thing going on here could be about um, uh, kind of this new venture, whatever this person's considering, and or the emergence of a uh, practical spiritual advisor, meaning the Gemini person. Because based on this, just Gemini person is really good, good at giving advice. And the Swati energy is not only about, is also has this um, link to Saraswati. Uh, Saraswati is the goddess of education, arts, and a spiritual tradition. So, um, looks like this person is, is quite adept as, a, as a, both a worldly advisor as well as a spiritual advisor because we have Venus and Jupiter mutually aspecting each other. 
And um, also the fifth house represents the intellect, so what's on the top of the mind. And so this person is a very benevolent, uh, minded person. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's going on. And what did I say? Oh, the fifth house also can represent things like tantra, yantra, mantra. So especially the if we're thinking of um, like uh, older religions, like maybe Hinduism or Sikhism or something like that. When we have this Venus and Jupiter in the fifth house, that can be somebody who's engaged in you know uh, spiritual practice like tantra, yantra, mantra, that sort of thing. Um, Uh, the other thing is that this may be, because this is the the fifth house for this Gemini person is the eleventh house for the spouse. If there's a spouse or spouse like person involved here, with this Venus in uh, Libra, its own sign, with this Jupiter, there's going to be a massive upgrade uh, for the spouse here in relationship in regards to uh, income, uh, but especially I think socializing groups and that sort of thing. Um, like maybe this um, spouse is, um, you know, like again, uh, because they also have Venus, because the spouse is also has Venus and Jupiter in their fifth house. So it may be that both the spouse and the Gemini person are mirroring each other in terms of they're both advisors and both of their uh, social groups are blowing up right now. Could be. Um, so, but there's, a, you know, again, the, the mental space for this person, very warm and fuzzy, very loving, compassionate, generous. So that's quite nice. Um, then the sixth house I already sort of mentioned, but we have the Mars, Combus, the Sun, and New Moon, and all of this in Jesta. So there's this protection seniority thing. So there might be a little bit of a scuffle here in terms of uh, family, but also work, because sun represents career, um, but sun also represents father, moon represents mother, moon represents the emotional mind, intuitive mind, Mars represents, you know, uh, conflict generally. Um, but luckily, uh, this is all happening in a house that Mars owns, so that means that there's less likelihood that the non- um, living items associated with this uh, sixth house, which could be things like lawsuits. Um, that's what's, what's going on, but it could be that there is some fallout with people. But I still think that there's protective energy here. And it may be that everybody's protecting themselves, like Mars, you know, the siblings, sun, father, moon. It may be that everybody here is protecting themselves. <laughs> you know? um, and so that may be why there's not as much conversation going on, potentially. Um, but it does seem like um, you do see Moon is about to shift into Sagittarius. Sun is about to shift into Sagittarius. Um, they will be going through Mula, that nakshatra that's about you know growing pains and stuff. So um, this energy will be resolving itself. It may take a little bit of time here, but it looks like we're moving on to this acute phase of some sort of conflict. Um, what did I write here? Protection, seniority. So there might be this, you know, jacking for position if this is work. Like, uh, this may be a boss or, and you, if you're the Gemini person who are like in, in conflict, um, maybe the son, the uh, boss person was protecting themselves. And because they were protecting them, they weren't protecting you. You know, And they just kind of laid, they laid out the law on you or whatever, because, um, uh, they're just trying to can, uh, protect themselves in this work situation. That could be, um, but also shielding the patriarchy. I got that as well because again, with the Sun Moon Mars combination, Mars and Moon are so close to the Sun, you can only see Sun. So you can't see the mental conflict going on here, the emotional conflict going on here. Um, the Sun is intact, so the Sun represents career, authority, father. Yeah. So, um, so again, there can be this uh, conflict, uh, family of origin versus innovation. The other thing is this Mars, Sun, Moon combination, Jesta is all reflecting in its twelfth house of hidden enemies. So, um, you know, again, it, it may be like there's a little bit of swiping that comes out from out of the blue. Um, 
the other thing about the sixth house is the sixth house represents um, daily habits. So uh, because Saturn is aspecting into the sixth house, and Mars is in this in its own sign in the eighth house, uh, and Mars and Moon are compass, so you can't see them. To me, this looked like uh, developing a new uh, daily practice or sadhana, uh, like a spiritual practice, especially because Saturn is in, in its own sight coming from the ninth house of religion. So this could be like uh, daily meditation or daily yoga practice, that sort of thing. Um, developing just some daily habit, maybe it's reading scriptures, that sort of thing. Chanting mantras, because Venus is in its own sign in the fifth house of Yantra Chantra Mantra. Yeah. So that seems really important here. Um, yeah, so then, uh, oh, it could also be the sixth house also represents infections and accents, like acute things, especially with you have two fire signs, two, two uh, pitta planets. So pitta is like a fire energy. And so in Ayurveda, traditional Indian medicine, when you have a pitta planet, um, that can indicate inflammation. So this could be something like, especially with Mars here, this could be an infection. It could also be something like a accident. But again, because sun and moon are moving out of Scorpio pretty quickly here in the next few days, uh, looks like this is going to be resolving. Yeah. So let's go on to the next slide. So this is essentially the same slide. Uh, it's just the text on the right is changed so that we can go through the other houses here. So the seventh house I mentioned a little bit. So we have this Mercury aspecting Jupiter, aspected by Jupiter. So again, spiritualizing the mind, thoughts, decision, business, relationships. So there's this general energy because Mercury is the lugnation, the ruling planet for the chart, and it's sitting, nesting in Sagittarius with the ruling planet of Sagittarius on it. This is like spiritualizing the whole chart in my mind. Um, and then once this happens, once once the mind goes through this uh, changing process, um, the actions will follow once Mars moves into Sagittarius, which will happen at the end of the month. Like um, I think it's December twenty eighth. You're actually going to get Mercury retrograding back through Mula. So you know this Mercury person, a Gemini person, it's going to be it's gonna, they're going to you know weeble and wobble a little bit. Uh, through the mid-January, uh, almost the end of January, until Mercury, Mercury's going to step back temporarily for a few days into Scorpio, and then I believe it's on January 1st, is going to um, start, uh, it's going to go progressive and move forward again, but it's got to go through Mula again. So Mercury's gone through Mula three times. So again, there's this like, you know, two steps forward, one step back energy with this development that's going on with this Mercury person. That might be frustrating. Um, and, uh, but they're going to move through it, um, over the next few weeks. Yeah. So, um, and again, uh, there's a lot to be thought about here. So relationships, potentially new business, business relationships, um, and the actions will follow whatever decisions are made here. Um, but it's also about the kind of living in this, um, I think new duality, um, that's part of what's going on here. And this new duality, I think, is this, um, again, we haven't gone through other houses yet, but what's what's forming up for me is that this this Mercury Gemini person is, is branching out from their family of origin. I don't think it's like a, you know, a burning bridges type energy. Um, I think that this family is pretty well established in their thoughts. Um, and so this Gemini person though is, is is deviating from that a little bit, and so there may be some pushback, or at least the person's worried about pushback from the family, because um, this family looks like they're they're pretty um, um you know again pretty well established in religion, or at least uh, this person was yeah. So um, what are they right here? Deciding on new work, business directions. Yeah, because the seventh house is involved here, the ninth house is involved here, the tenth house is involved here. Um, let me just think about that for a second. Um, oh, because the tenth house of career and work and uh, daily activities and stuff like that is ruled by Jupiter. So, um, you know, it's it's all up for grabs, really. Um, 
because again, this Jupiter is ruling the whole whole chart. So um, just make sure that I think you know, I'm not exactly sure why I wrote that. Yeah, deciding on a new well because Ju because uh, Mercury is to some degree tied up or in some banda unidirectional uh, some banda technical some banda I guess you would call it with uh, Jupiter because Jupiter's aspecting onto Mercury. So even though Merc Jupiter's dominating Mercury, um, Mercury is also um, it's it's not a one way energy relationship. Mercury is also influencing Jupiter, but not to the same extent because Jupiter, you know, Mercury's just sim swimming in the world, you know, house of Jupiter with Jupiter on it. Um, but there is also contemplation here uh, on the world of work for this person. So I think that gets back to oh, that was the other thing. Just that's why I wrote that. Okay. So I was like, wait, I was like, why did I write? That? So anyway. When we assess career for somebody, we usually look at three houses to start with. So the tenth house is the obvious one because the tenth house is related to career and work, and and the tenth house is related to, you know, most people kind of have a nine to five job working for somebody else. That's the tenth house. Okay. Um, the ninth house can also be assessed for a career because the, uh, especially if the careers are related to the government. It's the ninth house that related to government. And you can see the ninth house here is very strong because Saturn is in its own sign. And Saturn can represent bureaucracy, but it can also represent religion. And then you have uh, Jupiter aspecting its own sign in um, of the seventh house, which is independent business. So what's what it looks like here is that of the three, um, I would say that the independent business and the government relationship is the strongest, or religion aspect, if you want to think about it as religion, is the strongest. So those two houses are related. And again, you have Saturn shining on Jupiter and Jupiter shining on Mercury. So I think there is actually a relationship between and it's sort of indirect, uh, by the way, aspect of Saturn actually on Mercury through Jupiter. So it's sort of like religion um, influencing spirituality, spirituality influencing Mercury. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so I think that's part of what this person is thinking about. Because again, I think that feeds into this whole notion of this really strong advisor is that this person's actually thinking of doing something like not just uh, their religion or spirituality is shifting for them in terms of how they practice, but they're actually looking to do this in a public way, in a formal way as a, you know, stepping out, like hanging up a shingle is like, I am a advisor of spirituality of some kind. That's what I was saying. So that's why I wrote that. <laughs> okay. Um, because again, I, I kind of go back and forth creating these videos over several days and sometimes I write things and I'm like, why did I write that? Anyway. I think that's what I was getting at. Um, then the eighth house here, um, the eighth house lord is a swa Saturn. And, you know, it's Capricorn in the eighth house of deep psychology. So, you know, that's about, uh, Capricorn isn't necessarily the most innovative. It's about, you know, being practical and respectful and traditional. So that's also, um, it's kind of a little bit different than this whole mercurial energy. Uh, that's going on here with like sifting back and forth. I think this deep in this person's psychology is that they don't actually like change. Um, but you know that might just be the tension between um, Capricorn uh, Capricorn person might also hedge towards being more conservative in their thoughts and practice because Saturn can also repre represent things like anxiety and skepticism and. Again, wanting, siding more on this, uh, you know, idea of maintaining the status quo. But there is this, like, you know, again, innovative energy as well going on with Mercury and then Mars in the Lugna. So uh, deep down, I think this person's fairly traditional, but they're exploring uh, here, it looks like. Okay, so... Then the ninth house is Swa Saturn, very strong. And then we have Mars aspecting here. So, okay, now 
we're bringing this innovation energy to this fixed air sign of Aquarius, Saturn in there. So there is some attempt to, <laughs> even though Saturn is so strong, you also have the strong Mars. So, you know, you're going to see some, some conflict here, some butting of heads in terms of the old and the new, the old guard, new guard type thing. Um, so in the ninth house represents father, authority, government guru, who set in their views, will not budge. Um, but there's some attempt here. Like I would even think patriarchy here. <clears throat> and again, it could be something like a traditional culture, like Indian culture, also satsang, a spiritual community. It can even be like tradition for tradition's sake. Uh, I just saw this movie on Netflix. Um, I think it's called Christmas as usual. That's why I listed that here. And it was kind of a romantic comedy, but the, the storyline there was like, there's this Indian guy um, who meets this Norwegian, I want to say Norwegian, or was she Swedish? I think she's Norwegian, Scandinavian woman. And they meet in LA, they live in LA, and then she's going home for Christmas, and then she ends up bringing him home for Christmas uh, because he you know, asked, asked her to marry him, and she said yes. So they, you know, she, at the last minute, brings him along, and this is a surprise to her family. And then, so he experiences their version, Scandinavian version of Christmas, and it's all about traditions, like what they wear, what they eat, uh, what they do. And, you know, with the, you know, everything, like everything's planned out. And then it's sort of like not questioned. And that that's him. He's like the Mars person. He's just like questioning all of it. Cause he's like, this only exists in your little world. <laughs> like this, and then this exists in India. So what's the truth here? And are you just using this as an excuse to, cause she, this woman was scared of telling the family that they're actually engaged. Like it was already a big deal for her to bring him home. Then it was a big deal for her to tell them they were actually engaged. So anyway. And then at the end, not to blow it for people, but like they find their way towards integrating cultures. <laughs> okay. And for some reason, this movie came to mind as I was looking at this chart. So anyway, if you're looking for a, you know, binge worthy Christmas movie during the holidays, uh, if you don't have enough to do, you might check that out on Netflix. Um, and I have no relationship with Netflix. It's just, I like movies. So there you go. I like to recommend movies to people. So um um, yeah, so that's kind of what's going on here. There's some like, you know, push onto this fixed, very fixed uh, ninth house. Okay. Then the 10th house, we have Rahu and Revati. So there's this desire, there's this ambition, intense desire to be outwardly hospitable, like on in the day to day, you know, and this might be like somebody who's actually bending over backwards to be nice and hospitable, but maybe like, at a cost of because the this retrograde Jupiter is the lord of this tenth house here, so that's also about compassion and justice and balance and you know uh, hospitality as well. So there's this you know strong move towards being hospitable and um, uh, that sort of thing. But there's this you know, deep down there's this growing urge to deviate from. Um, Okay, then we have the 11th house here. We have a retrograde Jupiter and Ashwini um, with the Saturn, really strong Saturn aspecting onto it. So obstacles, because Saturn represents obstacles and delays. With with this burgeoning courage, the development of new groups, income, or whatever that this person is attempting to establish here that's new, um, there's a drag here from the Saturn. And again, the drag... It may not actually be from these people, uh, potentially represented by the ninth house, but even in this person's own mind, because deep their deep psychology is Capricorn, you know, is a Capricorn energy. So um, they just might be um, reluctant or fearful, even of themselves, because they come from a very respectful, traditional mindset deep down. Um, even though on the surface they might be exploring new things. So... And then the 12th house here, again, I mentioned it reflects this like Mars, Sun, Mar Moon, and Jesta, you know, the, this defensive energy here. Um, so the thing is, this Mercury, Mar Mercury person, Gemini person might feel confused or pulled in two different directions, but you might actually think about like how do you integrate these worlds rather than all or nothing, black or white. Yeah, kind of like what I was mentioning, this Indian person, the Scandinavian woman couple, like how do they integrate holidays together? <laughs> so, um, 
Because they're both very traditional cultures. It's just very different cultures, right? And very different traditions. Um, and then also to consider like what's true for you. Like what's authentic for you? Like even though you're, this person looks like they're steeped in some very traditional world, is that true for you still? Wow. Or is there some, you know, deep impetus, drive, evolutionary impulse to shift a bit? Okay. Um, I think that's what's on the table here. And the thing is, again, it might not be this like, okay, it's got to be one or the other, but how do we integrate? And and sometimes like, especially when the kids have parents from two different traditions, it's like this parent's like very liberal and the other parents are very conservative. And it's like, what do you choose? Well, it can be confusing for the kid, but it also gives the kid uh, freedom, potentially, at least an exposure to different ideas. And then they can choose for themselves what's true and right for them, what's authentic to them. So it can be confusing, but it can also be liberating through flexibility and choice, as opposed to not feeling you have any choice, like you're locked into a tradition that's no longer serving or stifling, maybe. You know, that can't be. So it's, I mean, there's a plus and minus to both, right? There's a plus and minus to uh, looking for new things and new avenues, but then there's also the kind of stability and predictability of, of tradition. But it can be stifling. And, you know, that's what I see, too, with people sometimes from very traditional cultures is they are actually exploring new ideas, but they don't tell their family because they're worried about pushback. And so, like, actually in a school, I remember this woman, I think she was Vietnamese. And she met this, um, you know, Caucasian guy, and they were actually living together. Her family had no idea she even had a boyfriend. <laughs> And then they were together for years and years. And I don't know, like, I I guess, uh, I don't know, I guess she, he never picked up her phone or something. So they didn't even know about this guy that they were living together. And well, I guess that was true in this movie too, uh, with the Indian and uh, Scandinavian woman. Um, but I think eventually, you know, uh, they found out about it or she spoke up about it or whatever, once they were really established. I mean, I don't know how long they were together. They finally got married. <laughs> So eventually, eventually the family found out about it, but it was like long after uh, this couple was very established with each other. Um, but that's the thing is like, in a way, um, was it direct lying? I don't know. Like maybe they just deflected, con you know, questions. <laughs> but, you know, for that, for them not to share for that long, there is some holding back and not speaking, not sharing with the family. Yeah. So um, I have seen that with people, you know, again, with from very traditional or conservative families that they don't feel like they can be fully honest about who they are and their own beliefs. So that may be part of what's going on here. So this choosing from an abundant buff buffet is out there. That's an idea. And, you know, you make your own mix. You make your own masala. Like, uh, you know, masala is a spice mix, uh, like masala tea, just a spicy tea that they typically uh, drink in India. Um and, you know, people have different mixes, you know, there's different mixes in Gujarat and Punjab and different areas of, uh, you know, uh, India. And even like uh, myself, I make uh, chai every day pretty much. And, you know, I mix different, some days it's cinnamon only, some days I add in ginger, you know, it's it, it changes day to day. So, you know, this is all about this person figuring out who they truly are and what they truly want. And then uh, soon, soon after this, uh, the... Uh, appropriate actions will follow but there's some confusion or sorting through at this point okay so then i went into a bunch of the amsha subzodiacs um to see um just to confirm or not uh what i was picking up in the natal chart so let's look at that um and just as a reminder the disha sequence here is mercury jupiter saturn venus so when i go through the amsha charts here um, i'm circling those planets so you can kind of see what the current planetary period planets, where they are, where they're located. And then first I went through relationships here because I did fun relationships and stuff. So these first two charts are the Navamsha D9, which represents spouse and general relationships, and then the Drake and Ardre D3 and the siblings. So uh, let's look at the Navamsha first here at the top. So you can see um, Mercury's well-placed, um, Venus is well-placed, so that's good. 
uh, Jupiter's in a Jupiter and Saturn are in uh, the third house and the eighth house here, which indicate um, uh, a change in endings. So that's not too surprising because um, we did see uh, changes going on on this, you know when we looked a little bit from the spouse angle on the birth chart. The thing that was Jupiter's retrograde in an exalted sign here. So this looks like a pretty good change, whatever this change or ending is, there's some goodness coming out of this. Um, but the Saturn here, this is a little bit more conflicted. So, um, and again, this is the eighth house is the house of deep psychology. So again, this might be a deep inner change uh, that's kind of slowing down this process because with Saturn's aspecting onto this Venus here. Yeah. Um, so, and then just to note here, Saturn shifts, so if we're looking at the Shah sequence, Mercury, Jupiter, Saturn, Venus, Saturn shifts February of 2024. So we have a few months more of the Saturn sub-period Antara. Um, so this could be, you know, and again, the Saturn is on Venus, spouse, sun, moon, parents, the parents here. So the Saturn could be slowing down our relationship with spouse and parents to some degree, but it's short-lived, you know, it's not forever, a couple months here. It might seem like forever, but, you know, because again, uh, this person, Venus is a Shidragraha for them. So relationships are a vulnerable point for this person. You know, social, social circles are important, you know, a vulnerable point for the person. Um, and then Jupiter, though, doesn't shift until September 2025. So we're looking at a good year and a half of this Mercury-Jupiter period. Um, so Mercury and Jupiter are going to be active for quite a while here. So again, we're looking at long-term changes here that are going to be slow slow and steady it looks like um, but especially Jupiter and Mercury this is like education um, psychology thinking um, teaching a spiritual advisor all this sort of thing um, so there's going to be changing improving communications with spouse um, and uh, spiritual community of spouse and why did I write that uh <laughs> oh, because, <laughs> because I wrote that because this Jupiter retrograde in Cancer in the fifth house for the spouse, you know, this Navamsha here, is the ninth house of their spouse. So this is spouse of spouse gets back to the native. So this is like a major shift and change in the spiritual community of the native of the uh, birth chart that we started with. That's why I got there, yeah. Also, Mercury's here, long-term changes. So uh, there's a beneficial shift in the ancestral line. We also have Saturn aspecting into this uh, fourth house. So that's gonna strengthen this Mercury here. But again, we're kind of getting back into, uh, you know, uh, patriarchy, you know, the sun. Um, it represents the father, so kind of a patriarchal line. Um, we also have Venus and Moon aspecting into this fourth house, and Venus and Moon are, have dig ball or directional strength in the fourth house. So there's going to be, you know, some emotional shifting here, but I think this Moon and Venus are going to bring a lot of uh, positive energy to this shift and change that's happening uh, with the ancestral line here. Okay, and you can look at it either way because, again, this Mercury, Moon, Sun, Venus uh, situation is on the 410 axis. So both the spouse, who is the um, uh, person that this D9 is looking at, and their spouse, which is this uh, native of the birth chart we started with, they're both seeing changes in the ancestral line. Uh, but I think they're benef beneficial uh, changes. Uh, it's just it's going to take a while to, I think, adapt and get used to it deep down for themselves and the family, that sort of thing. Um, this looks like both uh, the natal chart person and their spouse are both going through this shift. And it may be through one person's side of the family more than the other. That's a possibility. But again, once they're married, if they are married... Um, 
you know, then the in-laws become part of the ancestral line as well, right? Because it's like this uh, merging of uh, branches of the river type thing. Okay, so yeah, some challenges here, but I think overall still positive. It's just slow going, probably slower than uh, the spouse or the native would prefer. Then if we look at the Draken of the D3, this is siblings here. So you can see Saturn, Venus, Jupiter, these are all positively placed. Uh, Mercury's in the third house of change and uh, uh, endings potentially. But um, so this there is going to be a long-term shift here. But again, this is a sibling of the native and the third house in the D3, the third house in the Draken is a sibling of the sibling. So again, we're getting back to the native here. So again, we're getting back to the challenges are really more with the native, within the native, than I think with these other people in their life. And there may be some communication things that are going on with the sibling. Um, maybe they get some texts or emails or something from the sibling that they help them sort out with. But it looks like the sibling here is a pretty good, you know, solid advisor. Uh, Saturn is swa here in the Lugna. Um, and we have Venus and Jupiter on the Lugna as well. So it looks like this person, the native, is getting pretty good advice from their sibling, is what I'm seeing here. Although the sibling looks like, um, you know, they're kind of a mix here because the Saturn is in Aquarius, so it, this fixed idea, ideology the sibling has. Um, but also it's like integrated with this Venus Jupiter. So it's almost like the sibling is also kind of an integrated person with this traditional energy, Saturn swa with this Venus Jupiter kind of warm and fuzzy energy. So it looks like maybe the sibling has, um, um, is an older sibling. Cause again, in the birth chart, the Mars and Jasa. So this could be an older sibling who's already kind of gone through this change, or, you know, it might not be a sibling, but an older, you know, sibling-like person, you know, who's already kind of gone through this process of integrating the old world with the new and is giving this person some advice on how to move through this is what I'm saying, yeah. Um, yeah. So I don't think it's a major thing going on with the sibling. It's just I think the sibling's um, helping the native move through this shift and change. And more relationships. I looked at the Subtumsha D7 for children, and Dwadashumsha D12 for parents and grandparents. Um, so if we look at the D7 here, look at the Venus, Mercury, Saturn, Jupiter, all in positive houses. So, you know, the kids are okay. You know, this isn't going to be, especially if this person's thinking of, you know, diverting, diverging a bit from traditional family line, especially related to spirituality or religion. The kids are going to be okay. Um, and you can see here uh, that there's a parivartan exchange of houses between Mercury and Jupiter. There's this double-sided green arrow here. And so Jupiter, just sitting where it sits, is going to aspect into this lugna for the children. And Mercury, when it does the exchange of houses, is also going to aspect into this lugna of the children. So actually, uh, it looks to me like this change that's going on with the native is actually going to benefit the children. And the children uh, might follow suit in terms of having a more integrated uh, approach to spirituality religion that is, uh, may very well uh, be uh, a profession for them, a career for them. Like they might be a teacher educator because with Mercury and Jupiter, those are the two education planets and they're both have Digbala in the Lugna. They're both super strong. And Jupiter's retrograde, aspecting into its own sign. That's a super strong spiritual, you know, placement there. And then Mercury uh, coming from when you swap it from this its own sign of Gemini into the Lugna. Again, that's a, that's a lot. This is a Brahmin here. So uh, the children looks like. Um, so a Brahmin is a is a past of. Um, kind of more kind of spiritual uh, education type uh, cast and cast uh, meaning the traditional thoughts on caste system where it's more of uh, somebody's uh, kind of mental process, not like one caste is better than another type of approach, but you know, they're just people who, you know, some people are more uh, uh, practical and some people are more interested in ideas and education and some people are more interested in uh, 
being, you know, being a servitude and stuff like that. So again, not better or worse. It's just uh, the children uh, look like they're actually going to benefit from this change. So if the person is worried about the children, the children will be okay and probably benefit again, looks like. Um, but they're going to have, the children are going to be more kind of dual-minded and have more of this um, you know, integrated approach to spirituality and education, it looks like. Um, Yeah, so that looks okay to me. Um, what was I going to say? And again, this Jupiter, uh, when you do the Parivartana, is going to come back into its own house here in this fourth house of family lineage. So there is, and you have Saturn there, which is tradition. You have Rahu, which is innovation. So it looks, again, for the, ch the parents or the uh, parental ancestral line to the children here, there was a divergence. You can see that here. And and that's okay. It looks like it's just, you know, part of the evolutionary flow. Um, like I know with my teachers and, you know, Ayurveda and yoga and uh, Jyotish and stuff like that. I mean, they're very traditional. You know, they try to be very respectful of the um, tradition. Um, but even like, especially during the pandemic, um, they didn't do much uh, online teaching because, again, the traditional way to teach uh, Ayurveda and Jyotish and, and yoga is like you go and sit at the feet of your guru in person. Um, you know, you don't do some online Zoom conference. <laughs> you know, that's like a bit, you know. But the thing is, like, that pandemic forced the issue in a way. Um, you know, uh, because people needed that information and that knowledge, but they had to get it through new means. So that was an innovation. So now they're going gangbusters. It's kind of funny. They were very reluctant to step into that online teaching, and now they're going gangbusters uh, in that direction. So, you know, so it, you know, that's the thing is it's like, you know, is it tradition just for tradition's sake, or is this part of a natural, um, solid evolution? You know, and it's important to contemplate rather than just jump on some bandwagon and, you know, whatever latest trend. Um because that's where some of the power comes for these traditions is that they've, they've endured, they've lasted through centuries and, uh, you know, millennia. Um, but again, evolution is always happening, man. Right? So, um, yeah, so the kids are going to be okay if that's a concern. And then the parents, grandparents here, Dwada Shamsa D12. So you can see, like, they're all positively placed again. So Jupiter, Venus, Saturn, Mercury, the parents are going to be okay. Um I think whatever's coming up here is just, um, again, more theoretical. If there is any kind of pushback or any conversations, I think uh, it looks like the parents are just mostly uh, concerned um, that this person's thinking well through this process. Because, again, even the parents are, are good advisors here. Uh, they have Venus in the Lugna, and Jupiter in the fifth house is aspecting onto the Lugna. So the parents are giving good advice here. Um, I think they're just asking important questions, uh, not to push back on the native, but just to make sure that they're thinking well through this process and finding their own answers um, is what I'm seeing here. Um, yeah, and then, you know, Jupiter aspecting into its own house, the ninth house here. So the parents are going to maintain their spiritual community, even if there is a deviation by the native. That's okay. The parents are going to do their, keep doing their thing. They're okay with that. Um, and then the other thing is that, uh, you know, if, if maybe the native is concerned about the parents or what the parents think or the parents' point of view, because again, this is, a, it looks like a spiritual family, religious family that they're coming from. So maybe the native is like, oh, what are the parents or the friends or the groups of the parents going to think if I step out, you know, take a step out to the left here, what's going to happen? If parents are going to be okay. You know, don't worry about the parents. They're going to be okay. Um, so Rahu is in its own sign. Uh, we use this Rahu in its own sign in the Amsha analysis, not in the native chart analysis. But, you know, they're going to keep pursuing their social groups and stuff like that. So the parents are okay here. Um, so I think the primary stress on the native is, again, theoretical. Um, and it may, again, it's more of an internal struggle, I think, more than an external struggle with the family because, you know, the kids are going to be okay. The parents are going to be okay. The siblings and the parents are advising this person in a positive ways, it seems like. Um, 
so again, the stress I think might be one of guilt potentially um, of doing something new or different from tradition. Or the other thing is the stress of just having one foot in both worlds and like, how do you integrate that? Right? Like, is it 30% the old, 70% the new, or 70% the new, uh, 70% the old, 30% the, you know, how does that work? Because when you're doing something new, it's like, you know, uh, you don't have any rules to follow anymore. You, you get to set the rules potentially. So, so yeah, I was, again, uh, it doesn't seem like the relationships are too stressed from all this, if that's the concern. Okay, so that was all kind of relationships and stuff. Um, then I looked at career and income and, and reputation generally, uh, not just relationships and reputation. So, because it seemed like there were concerns about um, clubs, groups, society, spiritual and, and social, that sort of thing. So I was just looking at that to see what there might be along those lines. So I looked at the Deshamsha D10, which is career and uh, general reputation, and then the Ikadamsha, the D11. Uh, which is about income and awards, but or, awards you can kind of think of as public recognition. Yeah, that's a kind of a take on that. So, um, yeah, what actually really stood out to me at the Deshamsha here, um, you have Venus in the second house, which is exalted. You have Jupiter retrograde exalted in the sixth house, aspecting into its own sign into the second house. This is a massive blow up in a positive way in terms of being a public figure and being recognized um, uh, like voice and face, especially um, as a public speaker um, and advisor. So this is, this is actually a, 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 a what an upgrade for this person if they're worried. Uh, uh, so anyway, let's just uh, take a look though. So Venus is exalted. Jupiter is exalted. Jupiter retrograde is, is aspecting this Venus. That's huge. We do have Saturn and Mercury in the third house of change and endings. But again, it's kind of like, I think what I'm seeing here is like that seed energy where it's like the seed has to die to itself to become the blooming flower bush, that sort of thing. You do have a um, Parivartana between Mars and Saturn here. So that's going to make Mars and Saturn strong. The other thing is that brings Saturn back to Mercury, kind of like in the natal chart, where again, it's like this innovative thought process, innovative education, uh, speech, that sort of thing. Um, and again, especially written communication. So especially if part of this advisement is through like, I don't know, blogging or something like that, or maybe uh, writing uh, in the news or something, news, newspapers or something like that, that could be part of what they do um, or like newsletters. Um, that's all, that's all good. It looks like um, because in the Amshas, we like uh, the planets to be strong. And so even if the, you know, they're what we consider negative houses, the fact that Mars is uh, exalted in the 12th house and then it aspects back to its own house um, of uh, communication and siblings, um, that's going to that's gonna mean that any sort of losses that happen, because not everybody, you know, not everybody's going to be on board. You might lose some followers or whatever, but um, it's going to mitigate some of the losses that may happen. But for the most part, it looks like there's going to be mostly gains that come from this change. Um, and again, the Mercury and Jupiter, though, that's a long-term change that happens uh, regarding thoughts, communications, um, but again, it just with its humongous, you know, blow up in the second house, this looks like it's actually going to be a very good thing. Um, and this uh, Jupiter retrograde exalted in the sixth house of enemies, that's going to protect from enemies there. It's going to soften that uh, a bit, although you do have Mars asking there. So again, if there's any pushback from anybody, you know, there's always going to be haters or whatever. Like actually when I was looking at this, it reminded me of um, sometimes what I've seen with like um, uh, vegan groups, people who are vegan. So even though I think part of the philosophy of being vegan is like to do no harm, like to animals and the planet and stuff like that. Sometimes if somebody is part of a vegan group and then they decide they want to go back to, I don't know, being just vegetarian or maybe eat meat again or something like that, sometimes they're really like, they get a very hostile response. Um, 
which is again ironic considering what vegan groups I think are supposed to be about. But um, it can be like that. You know, there are just some people who are that way. Like it's you're you're with me or you're against me. Like you know, and so it has nothing to do with this person. There's just always going to be some people who are kind of like that. You know. Um, so I would I wouldn't worry about it because again it looks like there's going to be a lot of people who are on board with whatever you're doing here. So uh, it's, the other thing that was interesting in, in this D10 with career and reputation is that uh, Rahu and Ketu are in the Kendras. And the Kendra is the four central uh, squares or diamonds here. That's like the um, you can kind of think of that as the core energy for chart of the person. Rahu and Ketu are unusual and unconventional. So it does seem like there's a destiny pattern for this person to do something unconventional with their career. So if part of what they're looking to do is become like some sort of spiritual advisor, then going in an unconventional direction is what's, you know, kind of on board, you know, and um, what this person's supposed to do. So if they have any internal conflict or guilt or whatever, this looks like their destiny pattern, and that's what's supposed to happen with them. Um, then the Ekadamsha D11, Income and Awards. So here, Venus and Mercury are well-placed. So, you know, again, that's good. The other thing is you have a Parivartana between Mars and Mercury. Um, so again, you have this Mars-Mercury interchange of energy on some level. Um, Jupiter is retrograde uh, in a negative house, but again, it's swa, so that's going to protect, uh, you know, the sixth house of enemies or whatever. So again, and you see like this really strong Jupiter is like sixth house, sixth house in both of these, a like, career, you know, kind of professional reputation and then also public reputation. So there may be, there's always a few haters, but, you know, out there, but it doesn't look like, because again, you have Mars uh, aspecting into uh, the sixth house because Mars is in the third house here, but uh, it's going to be okay. You know, it's going to smooth over. Uh, and it's going to get better, especially when you have a strong uh, planet in the sixth house. That means that that house generally gets better over time. So initially there might be some pushback, but you know it'll blow over over what time looks like. And then Saturn is swa uh, in the Aquarius again. In uh, the eighth house, so that's also um, interesting uh, because uh, there's a fixed ideas here, traditional ideas. Um, so, and that's short lived because Saturn again is only that period's only happening for a couple months, so there may be a little bit of pushback. But actually, ironically, Saturn, Swa, and Aquarius being this strong. Um, in the 8th house, you can actually, when you get a strong planet like that in the 8th house, that can actually symbolize a alternative, like a very alternative, innovative mindset. So this alternative mindset may be something like adapting or adopting a, maybe Indian cultural techniques or something, you know, or spiritual techniques or something like that. You know, like I was kind of, when I was seeing this, I was kind of thinking of like, a, like they have those... Um, programs where it's like yoga for Jews or yoga yoga for Christians and stuff like that. So again, there's like this attempt, even with products like that, where they're attempting to, um, because yoga itself is is not a, like a particular uh, like religion. There's a lot of techniques, uh, yogic techniques that can be beneficial for somebody who's developing their spiritual life in whatever form, like, you know, see is a Sikh or Jew or Christian, Muslim, whatever, it doesn't really matter. Because uh, yoga is neutral like that, but that was kind of like the energy I was getting from this Ekadamsha chart. Um, so, um, yeah, and then also the moon is Swa and the Lugna here. So that's a pretty positive uh, implication that there's a positive uh, public uh, purpose or identity here. Um, so that seemed pretty good to me. Um, so even though there's a little bit of challenge here, again, it mostly seemed like things were going to work themselves out over time if there was a little bit of uh, maybe short-term stress with the change. Because anytime there's change, you know, just some people are against change, even if it's good change. They're like, ah, oh, you know, they they quib about it, you know, 
for a while and then once it, you know they kind of have a chance to adapt and like oh yeah this is like the best thing ever you know like my uh my teachers and like ayurveda and jyotish you know you know they're you know first they're like no 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 you know and then now they're all gangbusters about it so it just you know some people need some time to adapt that's all um what else should i write here i think i mentioned most of this um Oh, this Venus. So Mars, Mercury, Parivartana. Um, you know, deep transformational uh, energy is a speaker advisor because you have this third, fifth house uh, attention here or interaction here. Um, I talked about Jupiter, second house was aspected by Jupiter and Saturn. Oh, okay. So this Jupiter Saturn thing again. Uh, which happened in the in the birth chart with Jupiter being the planet of optimism and Saturn being the planet of skepticism. There can be this temporary again. Should I? Shouldn't I? Do I have the guts to do this type energy in the second house of you know speaking, for example? Um, how do I integrate these things? That can also be the thing, this new spirituality with the older traditional religion. Um, and then the 10th house of career, uh, because they both aspect the 10th house of career. And Saturn, super strong Saturn, is um, debilitated in the 10th house of career. So it could be that this person takes a while to develop their confidence, was what I'm getting with kind of their... Um, public speech and finding their professional public voice and career here. But again, over time, it looks like this will all smooth out. So that's what I was seeing there. Okay, so uh, then I decided to go all the way down the rabbit hole and look at health um, because in that natal chart, the uh, Mars, Sun moon combination and the sixth house of acute illness like i mentioned that could indicate maybe an infection or maybe an accident that somebody is recovering from um so i just decided to look and see if there was anything related to health um that was obvious in the uh, birth chart but um so i looked at the tajik shashtamsha d6 which for acute illness the tajik ashtamamsha d8 for a chronic illness and the bamsha d27 for strength Let's go through uh, top to bottom here. So you can see in the Tajik uh, Shashtamsha, Shashtamsha, the D6, this is an acute illness. And you have Venus, Mercury, Jupiter, Saturn. These are all positively placed. Actually, all the planets are positively placed. So it didn't really seem like uh, there is really much going on here uh, in terms of acute illness. If there is, um, uh, I, didn't, I didn't see it. So... Um, the thing though is that these planets are uh, aspecting are in uh, 5B, so counseling, 9B, so satsang, a spiritual community, 10B, uh, the um, career, and 11B, uh, public support, you know, and stuff. So it looked like things are okay here. Uh, I wasn't worried. Uh, and then the Tajik, Ashta, Mamsha, D8, so for chronic illness. So you can see here, Saturn, Mercury, Venus are all in positive houses here. The only one, Jupiter, is in the... You see, Jupiter keeps ending up in the sixth house. That's pretty interesting to me. So there's a lot of protection here, which gets back to the natal chart of the Jesta of uh, Mars, uh, Sun, and Moon all in Jesta, that protective energy. It looks like there's protective energy deep, you know, under the hood here uh, for all these things. So... Um, so Jupiter is exalted uh, and aspecting into its own sign here of uh, Pisces in the second house. Uh, but Jupiter, though, is with sun and moon. So this could be parents, you know, father, mother, and acute illness, chronic. But it, see, it's in chronic illness, but it's in the acute house. So... This might be just an ongoing thing. This might be part of why this person's even worried at all, because the <laughs> I think these these it looks like the parents are just kind of of the bents and kind of in the habit of whenever this person brings something up, they just make sure that they you know really think through 
uh, their thoughts and decisions before they go ahead with them rather than just, you know, being, you know, impulsive or something like that. Um, so I think that's just the nature of these parents, but I think they're well-meaning. And again, it seems like if there's any issue with the parents, um, that this person might be anticipating, um, you know, it's going to, it's going to work itself out over time because again, this Jupiter is super strong in the sixth house and that'll get better with time. Um, and any conversations here, uh, second house and also family and second house, um, it's going to be okay also. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think whatever, uh, that's, that's this sort of acute illness and the chronic illness thing. Uh, yeah, I think it's just that the parents want this person to think through their choices or their decisions, but I don't think that they're actually going to have a problem with it if they're well thought through is what I'm seeing here. But again, this person might be like, you know, kind of like, Oh, what are my parents going to say? They're going to, you know, they're going to question. And that's just the nature of the parents. Uh, not that they're really pushing back and being, hostile towards this person. It's just, I think they really just want to make sure this person's thinking through things well and deeply, you know, that's it. And then the Basha, Bamsha here, D27. So this is general strength. So this was interesting to me. I was kind of surprised here um, that all four planets, uh, you know, again, th that are in the current Desha, Mercury, Jupiter, Saturn and Venus, they're all in these uh, potentially negative houses. So there is some stress here. So this person is uh, fretting for sure. Um, and I think the biggest... Um, it, it seemed to me like the biggest um, kind of issue here was this... Uh, um, eighth house here where Mercury and Saturn are sitting. Um, that seems potentially virulent because Saturn is debilitated here in Aries and Mercury's here. And Mercury's the Mahadasha. This is the longest running period, which is going to be running for a few years here. But there is a, there is a saving grace because Mars and Mercury are in a party of Archon. So again, there's this tension with Mars and Mercury here. And Mars is going to come back to its own house. That's going to bolster, bring some courage and, and you know, like <laughs> to the Saturn um, that's struggling a bit here with this deep psych psychology stuff. Um, and that's also like a, an integration point. So Mars is the innovator and Saturn's the traditionalist. So we're going to have an integration, deep psychology. It's just going to take some time, um, I think. Uh, that looked okay. And then you also have this Jupiter uh, from the sixth house. Um, you know, aspecting the whatever Mars or Mercury, either one that's going to end up here in the 10th house. So Mercury gets stronger when it goes to this uh, Gemini in the 10th house. So Mercury's lifted up. So that's going to pull up this whole Mahadasha, this whole planetary period that this person's running. Um, and then the other thing is when Mars is in this 8th house, it's going to aspect into uh, this second house of family and speech, but also it's going to aspect and, and, and shore up this Venus. So luckily this party of Arjun is going on because I think that really saves, you know, Saturn and Venus for sure, because Mars is going to be in its own sign or aspect its own sign. And then Jupiter's helping out a bit. So again, even though this person's feeling stressed, I think they need to just understand that this is a deep transformative process and to be a bit kind to themselves. And it's going to take some time to, to kind of get their sea legs with this new change that's happening. But again, I feel like this, this stress or tension or feeling drained or whatever um, is just part of the process. So I think they need to go kind of easy on themselves and just uh, work with their, you know, this fears and, and guilt or whatever that may be coming up through this change. Um, because I think it's mostly internal, um, more, more than like some external thing. But what did I write here? I talked about the Parivartana, Mercury, Mars. That pulls pulls this whole thing up, really. Um, and then the Saturn, Mars, like tension of wanting to move forward, but slow. And sh so this this Saturn debilitated, you know, this this change is not happening as fast as this person would like. Um, but that's kind of the nature of this kind of change. If they want it to be a stable change, 
you know, it's 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 going to happen on a deep level. But again, the Saturn debilitated, um, this could be fear and skepticism, doubt, anxiety, you know, deep in the psychology here. So um, that's what this person's up against. So again, I think it's mostly this mental mental stress, you know, dealing with this change that's going on here. That's kind of, uh, you know, bringing this person down. But luckily, this Mars is kind of, you know, chutzpah, this bravery that Mars is bringing here is going to lift, I think, most of this up. And then the spiritual energy as well, like, you know, spiritual practices, it's... Um, going to help bolster the, the Jupiter, the spirituality is going to bolster the Mars, the bravery, and then the bravery is going to bolster this whole deep, you know, ongoing uh, change here. Um, so again, the, um, and uh, we do see again, uh, sun and moon together, and they're in the fourth house here of an ancestors, sun and moon, dad and mom again. Um, uh, Mars is aspecting onto that, uh, the fourth house. And when we switch Mars and Mercury, Mercury's, you know, aspecting onto there. So again, there's, a, they may have some concerns about conflicts with parents. Um, but most of this is theoretical. It's a, it might be a clash of ide ideology, but I don't think like this person's, I don't think this person's going to get so disowned or something like that. That's not what I'm seeing here. So if that's the concern, um, but again, I think this is mostly self-generated stress and theoretical and um, uh, more than actual true uh, difficulties, really serious difficulties that can't be overcome. So that's what I'm seeing here. Okay, and then finally, <laughs> um, I looked at the spirituality-related amshas. Um, yeah, just to see, because again, what I was picking up here was that this is mostly about spirituality and religion or something like that. And look what we have here. So I looked at the Tajika Pancha, Pancha, Panchamsha, the D5, which is innate spirituality. And I also looked at the Vinshamsha, the D20 for worship. And this is more like formal worship or structured worship, like more religion you can think of. And so the first one's kind of more what this person naturally does. And then the second one is more kind of the formal societal uh, structure of religion. Yeah. So first off, uh, this uh, Panchamsha, you can see I circled here. This is the same Lugna as the natal chart. That already indicates it's like, you know, put a puncture, you know, put a exclamation point. That means that this chart's important. And so I, I, that didn't surprise me, actually, that the innate spirituality, that's what's kind of coming through through this for this person at this moment, and that's what they're dealing with. Even though they have this, uh, it seems like, very traditional background and growing up and family, that this is what's emerging here. Um, so, you know, it's like ding, 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 you know, it looks like we found it. <laughs> you know, kind of the crux, uh, kind of the real golden nugget here um, of what's going on. All the planets are positively placed. Saturn, Mercury, Venus, Jupiter, they're all positively placed. So that's great. Um, there is a Parivartana exchange of houses between Jupiter and Venus, which is interesting because Venus aspects into the Lugna here. When you do the exchange, Jupiter also aspects in the Lugna. Venus is a worldly advisor. Jupiter is a spiritual advisor. So again, we're getting advisor energy. <laughs> so uh, and we have Mars again in the Lugna. So this is a innovative spiritual advisor is what we're seeing. So more of the same. Um, it's also kind of nice that we have this Parivartana because with Venus flipping back into Taurus here in the 12th house, that's going to mitigate losses. So again, we're seeing like protective energy here. So um, so that may be why that Jesta was so prominent, you know, the sun... Sun, Moon, Mars, because again, it looks like siblings and parents are advisors here. So, even though they're kind of questioning, they're still, um, I think, leaving open for this person to decide for themselves. They're just helping somebody work through this process, which seems kind of complicated or deep, at least. Um, um, and then the thing that's also interesting is that look, Mercury is in a sign of Venus. Venus is on a sign of Jupiter, or Jupiter's on a sign. Look at uh, these planets are all nested in like Venus and Jupiter energy. 
Um, and Saturn is nested in the swa moon energy. <laughs> it's just, you know, there's a lot of cushion here, like feel good energy here. And so that may be part of what this person's spirituality is all about is not only does it sound good or seem good on paper, but does this, does the spirituality feel good, you know, in my body when I practice in this way, that may be part of it. Um, and the Mercury in the fifth house, so writing communication advice. So that, again, that might be some sort of blog or article writing or maybe books. It could be books, you know, something like that. Um, so I talked about Venus, Jupiter aspecting Lugna as advisor. Yes. Mars and Venus aspecting, you know, involved with the Lugna. This is going to be a very passionate person. So again, it seems like they're kind of innate type of spirituality is much more kind of emotional and passionate rather than um, formal or distant or kind of just uh, rigmarole, you know, going through the steps but not being, feeling connected to the process. That's what I'm seeing here. Um, again, we have Rahu and K K2 in the Kendra. So again, there's going to be something unusual here, you know, unconventional with their type of, you know, their flavor of spirituality. Uh, We do have Saturn aspecting into the eleventh house here, where it's debilitated. Um, so that may be that finding your tribe is there's some difficulties or delays there in terms of finding that or building that. Um, what do I have here? Second Bhava structure. Oh, this is okay. This, so the second house here, this uh, moon, swa moon with sun and, and uh, Saturn here. So this is a very emotional second house uh, family. You have mom and dad here, um, Saturn structure planet, and also antiquity here. So, um, but this could also be voice. So finding your public voice um, regarding your innate spirituality. Um, Uh, it could also be um, like uh, older parents. You know, Saturn is kind of uh, something that's older. So, you know, again, there, there's a feel-good energy here in this uh, D5 here. Uh, we also have K2 uh, kind of, was that in the look? I'm just thinking back to the... Uh, Yes, we have that again, actually. We have K2 here in the fourth house. So there's a deviation, a divergence from the ancestral line. So, you know, and we have Jupiter here aspecting here into the fourth house. So uh, some unusual deviation of spirituality. Again, not unusual like, you know, bizarre, you know, uh, untoward or something, but just um, from, from where the ancestors were coming from, there's a change here, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's, that's all there. And then the Vin Vinshamsha D12, D20 worship. So look, all the po Raha is positively placed. So this is all good stuff here. Uh, Venus, Saturn, Mercury, Jupiter, you can see they're all on positive planets. There's a party Vartan between Mars and Jupiter. Um, and there's a party Vartan between Saturn and, uh, Saturn and Venus. So these are all super strong here. So this may be part of why um, this person had such a strong upbringing in a traditional, formal, religious household, um, and why it's they might be nervous about stepping to the side because this is so strong for them. This uh, you know kind of formal worship, you know, very structured type of worship is so strong for them. But it's all positive. So this isn't, you know, it's not like this is going away. I think they're just innovating a little bit, you know, integrating a little bit kind of new thoughts, new practices with the old. So this doesn't seem like it's over. It's just, um, you know, 2.0 version or 3.0 version or whatever 0.0 version it is now. Uh, but, you know, all these part of Vartan is going to make this super strong. That also means that uh, Saturn, Venus, Mars, and Jupiter are going to be all over this house, <laughs> all over this chart. So, you know, uh, yeah, good luck sorting that out. Um, 
the second house, we have a swa Rahu there. Um, we have, uh, with Saturn uh, flipping back here, we have a swa Saturn, which is interesting because we're going to have a super strong innovation with super strong uh, tradition. <laughs> so there's this, you know, dualness here. Um, and then uh, K2, so there's innovation. And then Venus, so there's this like worldly counselor of how to integrate old and new world religions is what I'm seeing here. And again, finding your voice. That The second house kept coming up. So whether it's voice or uh, kind of being known for your voice, being known for your face or family or inner circle, those are all here in the second house, symbolized by the second house. So all those things are kind of going through this integration process. And then this fifth, this fifth, fifth house and eleventh house. This whole five eleven axis is on fire here because you have, you have with the Parivartanas, you have Saturn, Mercury, Sun, Moon, Venus, Jupiter, Mars, all in the fifth house and all in the eleventh house. I mean, if that's not screaming out advising groups, <laughs> like I don't know what, you know, like it's just like, shh. You know, so very technically, there's a, what we call a pravraja yoga in this fifth house of counseling, advice, also yantra, mantra, tantra. Pravraja yoga is when you have four planets in the same house. That just gives somebody a very strong area of focus. So the person might have even grown up as like a spiritual advisor in a different tradition. Like maybe they were, you know, you know, like a worship leader in a Christian, like Sunday school or something, like a Christian based faith and then they switch to like judaism or islam or something else you know and so it's like so the faith is there it's just the faith is the faith is shifted you know there's a new version of the faith um so you know and i think that's you know if they're worried about parents and family and stuff like that i mean it's not like they went from being a uh believer of some spiritual tradition to like like an atheist like that would be that would be a really huge shift uh this is just kind of changing your flavor you know or brand you know of it um in my mind i guess um so but you know some people get really hung up on these things so you know so i can understand why somebody's nervous about this but um it looks like it's all going to be okay is what i'm seeing here it's just mostly an internal conflict going on here um, so yeah, but this fifth house, 11th house, I mean, advising and groups, you know, and public support, it's all there. I mean, um, and then this Parivartana with Jupiter and Mars, um, this could actually literally be leading groups into retreat or isolated places or like, uh, temples or churches, places of worship. Um, also charity is, uh, you can see here and also relieving any kind of losses that might come. So again, there's this because um, Mars, again, is in a house, uh, an aspecting another house. It's in a house of uh, hidden enemies, an aspect in the house of uh, uh, public enemies. But, you know, with the exchange of Jupiter, Jupiter's going to, you know, take the edge off all that. So, again, there may be some falling out or some conversations, but, you know, that's just uh, to be expected. And it, it doesn't seem like there's anything major coming from that. So that's good. So again, what I was getting from this is that, you know, the faith as a practice for this person is long and deep for sure. Um, but this is what's coming through here is just the new authentic version of it for them. And also what came to mind when I was looking at this is like just the notion, at least in the yoga tradition, you know, I've been teaching yoga for just about 20 years now. Um, you know, there are many pathways to God um, uh, when we talk about yoga. Um you know, there's like the, what they call a yana yoga pathway, and then the bhakti yoga, karma yoga, and raja yoga. So the yana yoga, yana yoga uh, method is like somebody who gets closer to divine and spirituality and enlightenment through their mind. So like Buddhists typically have this path because they're so mind focused, like their vipassana meditation and uh their koans, you know, depending on what uh, brand of uh, Buddhism you're into, you know, there's a lot to be said. Uh, there's a lot done there in terms of the mind and study, and, and or people who just study scriptures and you know, sacred books and things like that. I and mean, that's the path of the mind, the yana yoga path. Then there's bhakti yoga, which is the part uh, path of the heart. So these are people who like 
paint and dance, like the Sufi, Sufi um, Islam, uh, Sufis uh, who dance, you know, and they rotate and, and sort of this energy of the divine and stuff like that. I mean, that's all bhakti yoga or people who sing kirtan, you know, chant mantras together in groups and, you know, just express their devotion that way. That's a path of the heart. Then there's karma yoga. Uh, karma yoga is a path of service. So people who um, have a profession where they're of service or um, maybe they do a lot of charity work or something like that, um, where their actions, their charitable actions are their path to, um, you know, their spirituality. And then there's Raja Yoga, which is a combination of these three paths, which some people are on. So um, that's what I was seeing here is that, you know, again, it seems like this person is just going through an internal shift um, and they may be worried about fallout, but it doesn't look like there's going to really be much fallout um, from this, from their inner circle, their family, or, you know, up and down the ancestral line, parents, children, um, groups, whether it's spiritual community or public communities. And it actually looks, it's mostly for the best. It's just uh, this person, I think, um, is feeling a little bit tenuous about it. That's all. But they're protected. All that Jaste energy, uh, there's a lot of protection here, which we saw over and over again. So there you go. So uh, thank you for hanging out with me and listening to the talk today. As always, I appreciate your support of my work and channel and Vedic Astrology generally. So everybody who's subscribed and joined the channel, I appreciate that. People who stop by and listen to talks, uh, comments, uh, questions, uh, Find remarks, uh, donations, you know, all of it's appreciated. So thank you for all of that. Uh, again, all of my teaching videos on the subject of Vedic astrology are in my concepts playlist. You can find them all there. I do individual birth chart readings on Zoom. If that's of interest, you can email heartlightastro at yahoo.com if you want more information about that. Um, I also have another YouTube channel on natural medicine, which includes other um, kind of alternative paradigms of medicine, so other Vedic arts such as Ayurveda and yoga, as well as um, um, homeopathy and intrapathic medicine, and the name of that channel is Nature Source Care, so that's out there if that's interesting to you as well. So as always, I hope you found this interesting and helpful to you as you navigate the own energy cycles of your life. So take care, and until the next one, namaste.